So welcome to the China Log China podcast. Um, my name is Sabrina Weidmann. I'm the host of this podcast. And the podcast is about different topics all related to China. And today we picked the topic of young China. So I'm very happy to introduce Zach Dichtwald from the US. <laughs> and he wrote a book about, uh, well, it has the title Young China. And yeah, I'm very happy that you're here today. Thank you so much for having me. And I just realized I should probably have a copy of the book on hand, but it's in the other room. Oh, yeah, we should have. Yeah, I have the same problem. Maybe at some point we just run out. And I, it's literally just in the room next door. So I'd be happy to go grab it at some point. Okay, cool. Uh, otherwise, you. of course, it's we wonderful to uh, it's wonderful to get to talk to you over the wavelength. So as I if you do hear sirens in the background, I am in Brooklyn at the moment. I came back from a trip. I was in China for a month. I'm going back in another couple of weeks, and um, but if you hear any sounds in Brooklyn, that's what that's what's going on in the background. Okay, there won't be any sounds here in Munich because it's uh, well late in the evening, and people get quiet in Munich in the evening. It's better for it; it, it <laughs> preserves the quality of mind. Yeah, ex exactly. <laughs> quiet place to live. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about your book. Um, because we actually got in touch through your book. Um, I was, well, a friend recommended me your book because I was looking for some literature on young China. And I had another friend actually sending me a study. And I read the study and I was really like, oh my God, I really don't know much about young China. I mean, I'm like end 80s and you were looking into the post 90s. So I don't think I'm that far away, but I still had the impression that, well, this is so different. And yeah, she recommended me your book and I was really amazed um, because it was such a nice narrative like you could really dive into and feel the, the people's character thank you so, thank you very well done yeah really cool so um how did you actually get there like why did you go to china in the first place and how did this develop yeah um honestly i went so i i, I was there way earlier today. So I'm thinking about it a little bit more. I, I was an exchange student from Columbia. I went to school here in New York. I'm from California originally. Um, I wasn't a, a student of China. I wasn't an East Asian language and culture major, which is what they have over at Columbia for folks who want to study Chinese. I actually took one semester of Chinese and I hated it. Um, when I would show people around Columbia, I would sort of point to the third floor Chinese class and say, I think about exiting from that window every day. It's not, it's not a, it wasn't something that I enjoyed at all. But Why? When it came, it, it, I was just, I spent more time on that one language than I did on all of my other classes combined. And at that point, I did not see the value. I didn't have the interest, you know, and, and everyone who studies Chinese outside of China can probably relate to this. If you don't use it, it seems like an impossibly difficult thing to do. Um, and, you know, I don't think language is like math, and we can talk about this later if you want. I, I don't think it's something that you learn in a classroom setting. I actually think mm -hmm. the classroom setting probably detracts from the learning process. But again, we could, we could touch that later. So I, I was deciding where to study abroad. My, I was, it was late in my sophomore year, and I was a big science fiction fan. And I, um, when I was looking at where I could go, I figured I could go to France. I spoke French at the time, and please don't test me on it now. And... Um, and study history, really study the past, study history of ideas, history of art, history of uh, philosophy, history of, of government to a certain extent. Or I could go to Hong Kong uh, and see where everyone was saying the future was happening. Hong Kong was a linguistic loophole in Colombia's rule uh, surrounding study abroad. It knew, normally you had to be fluent in a language, but because I had that one semester of Chinese, which I hated, I was still allowed to go, and Mandarin, by the way, not Cantonese, yeah. I was still allowed to go to Hong Kong. Um, I went, traveled extensively throughout mainland China. I was the only person in the program who I knew who had a multi-entry visa and felt really pointedly that the China that I was experiencing, the China that I was rubbing against, up against, the people I was talking to were far different than the China that was being described to me in the media and even reverberating off of the people who came to Shanghai for a week had a business meeting, mm. you know, looked around, went home, and then we're all China experts, right? So it, it, I was trying to figure out why the China I was seeing and experiencing was so different than the China that was being described to me. So I went back to, I finished my semester, really liked it, um, learned a lot, went back to school and was, was thought I was going to be like a consultant, you know, when you, 
what do people do when they don't know what they're going to be after graduation? They look at consulting industry. And I, um, <laughs> I did too. I, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's attractive and you can uh, try different things and you don't know what you're going to do, but at least you'll be able to keep the lights on. And I, um, but I would just wake up every day and say, wow, it's cool to be here. Wouldn't it be cooler if I were waking up in China? And so I actually in a Bain interview decided that I didn't want to do that. Um, that I was going to move to China and I did, I didn't know anyone. I didn't speak the language. I didn't have a job set up. My plan was to go and try to sink in and learn the language and try to understand the people on their own turf. You know, I don't, I don't think it's a place that you can understand in a two week business trip in Shanghai. I wanted to taste the taste, smell the smells, feel the feelings and, you know, feel the fears and the hopes and the aspirations, but, but really sink into it mm. that's what i tried to do how old were you at that point 22 i was a dumb 22 year old i thought it'd be super easy i like didn't really think about how difficult it would be you know it's like you have this idea of going to china and and you know i'd be lying if i said it was just i was really anthropologically interested in china it wasn't all that i was trying to grow up too i was trying to you know you go columbia is a, a school of some prestige and i was worried i'd be some brat ivy league kid my whole life if i didn't <laughs> Really, I mean, I, I wasn't yeah. sure if I'd be able to do something difficult on my own. And, and so part of that was also that. Testing China. yourself. Yeah, you know, you want to you wanna see what you got. And, and China was the most interesting place and the most culturally, linguistically, and physically distant place that I'd ever been. So I, I wanted to go check it out for myself. And I think you worked in a school as a teacher at first, right? That's, that's I, how you finance I yourself? Like or? 20 different jobs. So okay. I, I was not, I, I started going, so the, I went with a backpack, the address of a hostel and the number of a language program at Suzhou University. Um, and I did the language program for like two or three months and then dropped it. And um, I did whatever I could to sort of stay afloat. So I, my method of studying Chinese was a little bit different. Once I got the basics down, I realized that, like I said before, like I, I don't think the classroom is the one place in any Chinese city where there's the highest concentration of bad Chinese speakers. Honestly, like there, there's no yeah, other place in Chinese yeah. where people speak as bad as Chinese as in a Chinese classroom. And so for five hours a day, if you're committing all your time to listening, um, Koreans, Japanese, Germans, Americans, butcher the Chinese language, you're going to end up speaking a butchered version of the Chinese language. And this isn't to knock all people who are currently enrolled in Chinese classes, but I figured there had to be a better way. And I'm not much of a linguist, but I, so beforehand, I did an enormous amount of research into the process of language acquisition and realized that the, the fastest way to learn Chinese was probably to try to change my entire mental diet. Mm. So the books I read, the podcasts I listened to, the TV I watched, the music I listened to, um, all the way down to the friends and roommates I had, um, to the uh, bad dates I went on, you know, top to bottom, I tried to make it so that my brain felt like it needed to learn Chinese. You know, you are what you eat, right? If you eat donuts all day, you'll look a certain way. Um, if you change your entire mental diet, the composition of your brain over time will change. It's hard at the beginning because you're isolated in your own country. You want to go out with your mm. international friends, but that will destroy that, that sort of prime ketogenic, mental ketogenic state, if you will, for your, um, for language learning. And, and so that's what I did at the beginning while also yeah. speaking English at night um, and being a terrible English teacher because I would always try to speak Chinese during my classes <laughs> um, sometimes the SAT, ACT. I was a golf teacher for a couple of weeks, which is funny because I don't know how to play golf. Um, you know, that's why I did it only a couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah, honestly, I was like teaching five year olds. I'm like, All right, I'll watch a couple of Yoku videos and I'll figure out how to do this. But then one of the parents asked if I wanted to go play golf with them, so I had to quit because I'm like, right, <laughs> okay, it sounds sounds good. But, you know, I was just trying to like hustle my way into a, being able to. I was basically saving. I was working for a month at a time saving up as much as I can, and then going to travel to see the country. That first year in China, I spent over 200 hours on trains. Um, what do you think, how long did it take you to actually get to kind of a fluent level so you could easily yeah, talk to people? I, I actually remember exactly where I was when I realized that I was conversationally fluent. And, and it was nine months in. 
that is the sound of I don't know who could be I'm not gonna go check that I don't know who's here I'm sure it's just someone trying to drop off a package um nine months in I remember exactly where I was I was on the roof of a of a hostel in Chengdu which was on the outskirts of town um, around the third ring road. It's CCY doll. It, it's already out of business. I was the first and last foreigner ever to stay there. I had hitchhiked from Chongqing to Chengdu with a friend I had made in a Chongqing hostel. And I, I described this in the book. It was the first friend I ever made based on our similarities. When you first go to China, you meet a lot of people and, and you have friendships based on your differences. Wow, we do this here, there, or we yeah. do this this way here, you do this way there. How bizarre and unique is that? Um, and most friendships sort of stall there. And most people's language abilities stall there. And I had developed this friendship based on our similarities, what we liked in music, what we were looking for um, in our careers, what we were looking for through traveling, what we were hoping for, what was our idea of a good time. Like, it was based on our, what we had in common. And this friend, Juan Juan, um, on the roof of this hostel, I realized I was surrounded by people who, was, who our relationship was not the defined or dependent on my foreignness and who we could talk about just about anything, even though there would have to be some, you know, every now I would, I was a furious Pleco user. Mm. And, um, but nine months in, and I know that sounds early, but you know, two years in, I passed the HSK six and I wasn't studying for it. Like it wasn't, there are better ways to learn language people. It doesn't all have to take as long as, as, as many of us think. Um, I mean, I, I remember that I was studying for three terms in Germany and then I got to China for the first, like my real first longest day. And um, yeah, I remember that I couldn't, I didn't understand the people and I couldn't talk to them because like everything I learned at university, I mean, it was a good, like a good baseline, but um, it wasn't anything practical. So I like, from my yeah. point of view, you definitely took the right approach. Um so yeah, it sounds. I think of it as sort of creating the, your class is creating an organization system for you to fit stuff in. Yeah. So once you have the organization system, you can do your own fitting. But like you know, I I did I had a really voracious um, flashcard regimen. I actually still study every single day, and all the TV I watch is still all Chinese. Like it's not like this mm. is done now. I um I'm kind of locked to it for for the rest of my days, as far as I can tell. Okay. But then it's like, you must have been in a very ambiguous situation because like in your book, you also describe how you teach those kids and the kids there, you know, like uh, under this pressure to learn and study and, you know, they have to go to school and study really hard and you actually took the complete opposite approach, right? You just like, yeah. And then yeah, particularly in Sujo, you know, I talked about Bella in chapter two, who mm. Bella would spend around 80 hours a week in the library. I think more than that. I, don't, I did the actual calculations in the book. But she would get there every morning at around 6.30 and she would leave every night at around 9 or 10. And every day. You know, what did you do on the weekends? What weekend? What mm. did you do on? Don't know what you mean. Um, and the craziest part was that Bella wasn't even a student at Suzhou University. She had just graduated and she was preparing to take a test that would define her future every single day, day in, day out, preparing for this test. And I was sitting in a library and would often try to, you know, compete in terms of study prowess with her because, you know, whatever, to give it a try. And it, um, the whole library was full of Bella's. Bella was not particularly remarkable, honestly. I mean, I was recently, I recently attended Bella's wedding and, and gave a speech at it, which was, so she, for me, she's remarkable, but in the scheme of things, she's, she's a, she's a very good student, not the best. Mm. And um, that was just sort of the rule of the land there. And, and I think for a lot of stuff, it makes sense. The Chinese education system, there's no doubt that the most defining characteristic of it is, is the importance of one score on a test. So the Gaokao, when you're doing your undergraduate, mm. the college entrance exam, you know, in America, if you, if you, and I don't know how this jives with the, the German system, in America, if you are the captain of the water polo or swim team, that's really great. That could help you get into college. In China, that's really great. What was your test score? If you were the captain of the cheerleading team, if you were the best debater in the, in the state of California, that's really great. What was your test score on the Gaokao? In China, this one test defines your outcomes. Mm -hmm. and for Bella it was for graduate school um and that one test if she didn't you know it didn't matter she knew 
if she, this was for translation, it didn't matter if she was the world's best translator. If she did not have a good test score, she could not advance down that path, period. Mm. And so for these kids that I was de- de- describing, I think in chapter three, um, I did, towards the end of it, I, I, I moved up in the world and was teaching at a sort of ritzy um, English technology school for kids of the sort of upper crust in China. Uh, you know, not the wealthiest, but but definitely upper middle class to upper class. And I had this one class, it was, um, there's one student in it that I particularly remember, but there was, I believe, six students. One of them's name was Jianguo. I actually think it's misspelled in the book, but Jianguo, it's a really old school name. It's create the country. Um, and he was adorable. He had like comb over hair and like corduroy pants and the sort of shoes that like light up every time you walk, you know, just like <laughs> an adorable kid. And he had five classmates and I would sit at the front of the class and it was sort of humiliating. I would have like a big turtle puppet on my hand and we'd be teaching them how to use robots essentially. And it would be a totally normal class were it not for at the back of the class, there was a glass wall. And behind that glass wall, there were 12 parents and 24 grandparents. So do the math, four grandparents, two parents for every one child. And so we think about the little emperor, right? That's the reputation of a lot of Chinese, single children spoiled rotten by an excess of of attention so that 421 this is great with the video because i can just line this up um 421 you have four grandparents two parents one child that creates a funnel we also have people who only listen but you're describing it well, well. I'm, I'm, I'm basically drawing an upside down pyramid right and, and mm-hmm. that upside down pyramid looks like a funnel you have attention you have resources and you have food and that's why a lot of people imagine these kids being spoiled and kind of pudgy and you know yeah. and, and ruined by attention at the end of the class, I remember going out and asked, I would talk to the parents and I hear Jianguo in the corner wailing. I go over to see what's going on. His grandparents are surrounding him. His mom and his grandmother are hunched over with, a, with pieces of paper in front of them, with a notebook. Um, I'm looking on the notebook. It's the word microscope, dolphin, amoeba, keyboard. These were the English words that we had learned that day in school. I asked his mom what's, what's going on. I didn't, I didn't assign any homework. She says, Jian Guo will have to take the Gaokao, will have to take the college entrance exam in 13 years. We're trying to give him the edge. So you think about that sort of attention without a doubt. Mm-hmm. Think about that, the amount of resources that are put on this one child. There's no doubt that it's way more than if you were to have four or five siblings as it was in 1950. But with that comes this crippling amount of pressure that not just Jenguo, not just five-year-olds, but 22-year-olds feel, 28-year-olds feel. And, and, it, and it leaks into everything. You know, the, the project of childhood from China to other places in the world, particularly the West, and I think Western Europe and the United States in particular, of course, it's hard to generalize and there are different households that do things differently. But the project of childhood on a macro scale is fundamentally different. What people end up doing every day and the, and the laws that dictate what's seen as valuable and what's not. Um, it, it's fundamentally different in China than what we have here. And so, you know, early lesson, if you want to start understanding the teens and the adults and the later consumers, which is, you know, which is what everyone sort of wants to know, mm. um, you have to understand where they're coming from. Mm. But um, my impression was always that uh, like those who are rich, they will send their kids like to like one of the schools that you just mentioned um, and take them out of the scout house system, you know, so give them a good yeah. education and then give them through Guanxi uh, a good job kind of. Um, that's actually something I also experienced or that was basically for me, that was the reason why I um, studied Chinese and went to China in the first place because I... Um, went on school exchange at the age of 15 to Australia. And the school that I went to, it also had a boarding school. And in the boarding school, there were mainly girls from China. And the parents were usually pretty rich. And I just took them out of the schooling system um, and make them study in, in Australia so they don't have to take the Gaokao, for instance. Yeah. And those were like also my first Chinese friends and I really liked this, um, their culture and so on. But when I actually got to China, I realized that those 
girls that I met there, they weren't Chinese at all. They were like really, you know, like Australian Chinese. They still had something of their culture inside, but they, right. they really adapted to the lifestyle in Australia. Um, right. So yeah, like that was my impression that rich people take their kids out of the Skauko system, but probably not all, right? But it's well, listen, no. So so you're you're yeah. making a really important point. So I'm going to speak to the specific point, but I'm also going to talk to a larger phenomenon. Mm -hmm. The specific point is yes, that especially much more. It's, it's becoming more popular. So even more than when when you and I were in school, um, because the people who went through the Gaokao system don't want their kids to have to go through it. It's a meat grinder. It, it churns out kids who are often all the same. And so we're, even though that international education is actually losing value in the eyes of most, most Chinese, uh, in terms of its uh, uh, sort of market value, you know, it used to be if you studied abroad, you'd go back and get a good job no matter what. Mm. It didn't matter where you studied, it didn't matter what your university was like, you were, you were rare stuff. And, and that was valuable. Um, now it, its value largely derives of first its ability to not be the gao cow. Um, and you know, if you study abroad, you don't have to take gao cow. The second is that there's this notion that Chinese education produces great test takers, not great content masters. And so if you really do want to master the content or be creative outside of a test taking capacity, then the education system best poised to do that is not the Chinese one. So that's the local point. The larger point refers to, and this is something that I'm sure a lot of your readers will be able to relate to, what in psychology is known as an availability bias. So it's judging what is available, using what is available to us to judge the whole. So only 9% currently of the Chinese population has a passport. As recent as two or three years ago, that number was 6%. And that mm. includes, of course, study abroad students. So the people that we meet abroad are already not representative of the larger population mm. by virtue of being able to afford a passport, by virtue of being able to afford study abroad tuitions, uh, you know, the entire international education system. And I, and I know that sounds like a massive exaggeration. It's not an exaggeration is being propped up by Chinese students right now. You know, one in three students studying abroad, abroad in the United States are from China. They pay full tuition. Again, there's still, there, still value in China. And um, there's all these parents who, who are interested in doing it. So, like, it, the study abroad phenomenon is very real. But in the same breath, it also isn't representative of the whole. Mm -hmm. So the larger point that I'm making here regarding this availability bias is this idea of what I call the Shanghai fallacy. The, the Shanghai fallacy is this idea that we go, that business people go to Shanghai. They have a good cup of red wine. They have a steak. They're talking to their English speaking guide who has spent thousands of hours immersing their brains in TV shows like friends and how I met your mother and having, and maybe studying abroad and, and having international friends um, looking around at what people are wearing and what they could read, you know, and so they can't read Chinese. So they're reading all the English signs and they go back and they think, wow, China is going, as China modernizes, it's going to westernize. In reality, Shanghai is the least representative city in all of China. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> in, and also in reality, yeah. those, those study abroad students who we're, we're talking to, are they the elite within China? Often, yes. Are they sometimes the biggest movers and shakers in China when they go back? Yeah. I mean, Jack Ma got denied like a million times, but he ended up spending time abroad. The founder of Baidu, the founder of Soho, Zhang Xin, um, they all studied abroad. There's actually great, and I, and I do write about this, there's great evidence that the people who study abroad are often the most successful when they go back to China. Yeah. Um, but are they representative of the whole? Probably not. That's uh, I recently read something really interesting, which basically said that, well, by studying the way Chinese do, like, you know, preparing for Gaokao and so on, and like this really intense study time, and then, <laughs> and right. then you, you go Don't abroad. I didn't mean to make you. <laughs> <laughs> and then you go abroad, and this, this kind of studying that they're used to, it meets those like like this freedom of ideas that you have in western countries and then it comes to kind of an explosion of innovative ideas and um that was written there but yeah it's probably just like you know this i don't know six percent of the yeah that's the hope that i mean so honestly 
the big question is with study abroad, why is it that a government who is so concerned with the mental diet of their population encourage their best and brightest and most resourced students to study outside of the country? Doesn't that seem a little weird? Like, uh, why, why, why is that? Well, the reason is just as China, when it wanted to become a manufacturing power, invited the world's best manufacturers into the country, learned from them, stole the IP, really, you know, let's, let's be mm. honest what happened. And then now, instead of just being the manpower for these manufacturing plants, they're now the, the management and the bosses as well. So China, in the same way that they imported all of the intellectual know-how to become a manufacturer, China was an agrarian society two months before uh, they started thinking about manufacturing. You know, this, they did not have an industrial revolution. So they needed to import all of that intelligence. Right now, similar to the manufacturing revolution China went through, the industrial revolution, China needs to go through an innovation revolution. Mm. The problem is Chinese schools don't churn out innovators. And yeah, I mean, they have this program, right? Which is, it doesn't really change anything. It's just a, a written document basically trying to push creativity in schools. Um, but what's actually happening? Like, uh, are students kind of aware of this as well, that they're like not creative or... Do they yeah. just not realize because they're, they're studying so hard or? Uh, honestly, yeah. You know, there's, there's an article that got really popular recently focusing on how the United States has so many uh, Indian CEOs, but no Chinese CEOs, more or less, or uh, CEOs of Indian heritage mm -hmm. or, or from India um, and, and no Chinese. And, and there's questions. Why is that? There's, I'm, you know, we're, my family's Jewish. We're from Berkeley. So we're not like, we're not. We don't practice, but we, um, we, when, I, when I go there, you realize that there's this there's enormous case study of, of Jewish families and why it is that that creates certain types of scientists and business people. And, and you know, what is it about that upbringing? Um, when I first went to China, I would walk down the stationary aisle, so where you buy notebooks and pencils. And on all of the notebooks, on all of the backpacks, on all of the pencil eraser heads, there was one guy staring out at you, and it was a Westerner. Um, the guy was Steve Jobs. So he had his signature glasses and his turtleneck and he like is gazing out at the world being like, wow, innovation is cool. And, and that was the message. It was like, look, if you, if you, we want to be more like Steve Jobs, we have to be able to innovate. The problem with Steve Jobs is he doesn't look very Chinese, does he? Um, you know, you need ultimately a hero with Chinese characteristics. 2014 comes around. Jack Ma, Alibaba, come to New York, have the largest IPO with Alibaba in the history of the New York Stock Exchange at the time. And suddenly Steve Jobs is wiped away from the stationary aisle and Jack Ma replaces him. Um, it, it's just, people understand now that the government is pushing, I mean, there, there's, there's, there's very explicit incentives from the government right now, not just for people coming back from abroad, but for people within the country, that innovation, starting up, entrepreneurship, these are the keys to unlocking not just the future of the country, that's without a doubt true, but also the future of your family, the future of you, you know, mm. individual. It's tough to make a salary and get ahead in China. You know, a lot of places it's 3,000 quai a month, 4,000 yeah. quai a month, yeah. like 500, 600 bucks US. But maybe you can unlock some exponential wealth uh, if you're able to really make something innovative and creative. Okay. But it's like the startup hype that's happening there as well, right? But I mean, it doesn't just get out of nothing. I mean, um, you know, when we go to school, like in the Western systems, we kind of practice, or tr like some people say it's not the case in Germany, but I think so. <laughs> They're actually practicing to be creative and to yeah. shape your own ideas and have like this, like develop this kind of logic sense and stuff which is just not there in China in, in many, like, well, in, in many parts of the system, I would say. Yeah. So how do they try to create this? I mean, there's probably not just this plan saying, well, we have to introduce creativity right. in schools, but... Um, Be creative now. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's hard. And like, what does creativity look like? Does creativity, I live in Brooklyn, does creativity look like all these people who don't seem to have the jobs and just fill up coffee shops all day uh, and, you know, say they're shooting a movie. I don't know. Um, or is creativity finding different ways of, of, of breaking up the supply chain? Is creativity finding new technologies that allow people to buy things on apps 
faster than anywhere else in the world, which we're already seeing everywhere in China. Mm. Um, is what, what I, we have a sort of hierarchy of creativity, and we think that the the top of which you know the the arts and the um, and and in the business world, like consumer design, like Steve Jobs wasn't mm. really a technologist to a great degree, but he had a great design eye and knew what people wanted. Um, there, there's that version of creativity, like the leather jacket um, <laughs> entrepreneur. Uh, is, that, is that the only kind of creativity? I don't know. I, I, Alibaba recently invited me to their Zawujia, their um, a maker's fair in Hangzhou. And gosh, the thing that some of these young entrepreneurs are putting out uh, in terms of design, in terms of green, uh, green energy solutions, in terms of um, just different services and how they're providing them. Uh, I think there's an enormous amount of creativity, but it just might not be the creativity that we yeah. look for when we dig up creativity. I, I can give you one example that I kind of like, if that's okay. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I'm curious because I'm also working with one example, but you, you, you start. <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to go first. And this is just to show you how that there are things being created. There's an entire ecosystem in China that we're not privy to. Um, in 2016, the United, Spa the United, Space, the United States <laughs> spent uh, one trillion? God, I should really get this number right if I'm going to do this. One trillion mm -hmm. sounds really big. One trillion does sound really big, doesn't it? I'm going to call it 1 billion, but we're, there's a chance that it's 1 trillion people. Forgive me. These denominations do not come easily. So a lot of money um, through, through mobile payments. So pay on your phone, mm. uh, it could be in a physical store, it could be online. Spend 1x denomination um, on mobile payments. That same year, China spent 60 billion. So 60x through mobile payments which means that there's an entirely different financial system. There's an entirely different way of purchasing things. There's an entirely different uh, set of platforms by which China wants and then has things. The whole development of desire is, is on a different track, is on a different evolutionary track in China. Yeah. There's an entire different way of commerce going on in China that only exists in China on this scale, nowhere else in the world, we all kind of roll our eyes on it, except for in Las Vegas, they have Alipay everywhere in Las Vegas. But th there's something entirely different that is ahead, beyond, in fact, what we've tried to create, I'm from close to Silicon Valley, what we've tried to create there and have failed, China's done it, and done it in a creative, innovative, uh, in integrative way. It's now in every aspect of society, down to the beggars. There's a, there's a few famous pictures of, of, of people begging for money using QR codes yeah, you can I know. Scan, <laughs> yeah. because no one carries a wallet anymore. Like in China, I do not carry a wallet. I have to spend three days coming back, getting used to this clunky thing in my butt uh, because I'm not, I haven't had it for the last couple of months. <laughs> yeah, that's so true. Yeah. And you know, like, I, is that I'm, creative? Yeah, yeah I think I, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I had a previous podcast uh, version with uh, one of my friends who's working on innovation as well. And he was looking into the drones industry in Shenzhen. And uh, what he found out is also, I think like it's really creative in a sense that they really integrate the customers into their whole ecosystem. And, hmm. and using those ideas that everyone just has is also like a very innovative way of dealing with stuff. How, how do you mean they integrate their customers into their, into their system? Um, they have a huge system of offline and online communities where people go and they try things. And if they don't like it, they bring in their ideas and then uh, the, the companies actually develop their ideas. You know, so it's like everyone's creative kind of, and then a company actually just picks up the ideas and uh, makes products out of them. So it's like, like yeah. listening to your customers, who would have, who would have thought, but yeah. most people, Something the problem new. is they develop the drones in Shenzhen. So if I'm in America and I'm a drone maker and I develop my drones in Shenzhen, it's difficult to be like, all right, there's this new plan. I can't just walk over the blueprint to the factory for the developers. There, there's a, and I, and again, this is not the sexy type of innovation. This is just supply chain stuff. Like yeah. if I'm missing a 15 hour flight or a 12 hour time difference and I can just walk this idea down to Shenzhen, God, is that, I mean, yeah. that definitely makes it easier. Yeah. I mean, the other example that I'm always uh, picking up is, uh, I mean, I was focusing on electric vehicles and I was just taking pictures of all those different 
kinds of ways that people managed to charge their cars because there weren't ch charging pillars, but they like kind of built their own cars, um, put some type of battery inside, and then they were just you know like hanging out the cable through the kitchen window and then yeah, charging I, in cars. I, I used stuff to like charge that. my e-bike through a cable, Jimmy rigged out of my third story apartment down, and, and now they have them everywhere but like I'll, I'll use the example of Mobike and again I'm using these massive examples because I think it makes it easier for people to imagine mm -hmm. so Mobike is is one of these um, bike sharing apps that we've seen by the way our media only focused on the horror stories which is like thousands and thousands of bikes stacked up somewhere uh, in a city and like ruining the society and it's really terrible but what it's done is it's made it's, it's offered mobility in congested cities to everyone in China and I was talking with one of my friends about this recently like China is still it still calls itself a communist country you know in 1950 when when or 1949 when the PRC began it was called a communist it was the communist party right in 1980 reform and opening still communist party 1993 during the really beginning of, of the real reform era uh, still Communist Party, today it's still the Communist Party. All, obviously communism looks way different mm. at each stage. But like, think about this. There's a, there's a point where the flying pigeon bicycle was the ultimate sign of success and wealth. If you had a flying pigeon bicycle in your household, you were, gosh, you'd made it. Now, every single person in the country can rent a bicycle for 15 cents. Try and tell me that the communist revolution hasn't, hasn't been a wild success. Honestly, there, there's like a... It, it, it's really I have never like, seen it from that perspective. It's like the dream realized in a couple of different ways. It's like, wow, like, gosh, we created a society where every single person can have a pretty nice bike, like, for 13 cents? Oh my, like, wow. If, if you would have told people that 30 years ago, they would have gone bonkers. They would have, like, there's no way. Uh, and, I've never um, seen it from this, <laughs> this perspective. I've, I've never heard it described. You know, this is a this is an article waiting to be written. But I, uh, yeah, it, go ahead, write the, it. The, the, the initial <laughs> communist dream. You know, we talk about like the middle class of China. Xiao Kong Shou Hui. Xiao Kong Shou Hui does not mean middle class like we mean it. It does not. It's not white picket fence and like a suburban truck. This is the American version now. Um, Xiao Kong Shou Hui refers to the angle coefficient, which is the amount of financial which is the amount of income that you're spending, the proportion of income you spend on food as compared to your total income. I mean, that's not a very luxurious, consumer-centric version of middle class. So if that's the metric that China is using for itself, and I think we forget how recently China was mired in deep poverty, like everyone being able to afford a bike is a pretty good indication that things are at least going okay. Yeah, that's absolutely true, yeah. Um, something else I want to talk about is this aspect of criticism. Um, because like, uh, well, what people always say, one big part of uh, being inno innovative is um, accepting criticism and having like a culture of criticism. Like in China, I'm never sure if they actually have one or not, because like, of course, you wouldn't directly criticize anyone. But on the other hand, it's a culture that you know people know they're criticized so you don't directly have to address them that way so right. it's kind of it's there i would say but just not in a way that we have it and i'm also not quite sure if this culture is really that important in um for innovation in china yeah. because that's people just do they don't you know it's that's that's a really good question i, I God, i've been in product meetings in china where people mm -hmm. just get torn to pieces um, if you are in a classroom in China, there is, there is no doubt that there is criticism launched at students mm. far worse than anything, you know, like intense me. Um, and it's sort of expected because there is that there's a, there's an exaggerated, um, hierarchy within the Chinese classroom. The teacher is the teacher, the student is the student. And though, and there's not really bridging of those two roles. Mm. Um, but how does that translate to innovation? I, uh, Obviously, there's not really a lot of criticism of the government in public spheres. I think this is normally what we end up talking about. And so I, I think it's better just to put it right on the table. Um, there used to be more this last year and a half. There's been a tightening up and uh, an increased paranoia around that. And, and it is one of the there's no real getting around it. It's one of the more major points of concern. Um, I would say in the startup sphere, though. The importance of failure. And the comfort with failure, I would say, in China is higher than other places I've been. 
including the United States. And this is a really bad example. So I'm gonna start with a bad one and hopefully think of a good one. Um, but if you've ever been to like a, you know, I, I always lived around universities because that's always where the best, cheapest food is. It's, it's good <laughs> economics. You know? Always high competition. <laughs> and you yeah. quality, otherwise it gets shut down. And um, I would always go play basketball at the universities. There's always big basketball courts. And one of the things I always remember being feeling remarkable when I, when I actually, when I first got there was how bad some of the people were at basketball and yet how okay they were playing with the great people. So I, you know, I, I grew up in a, in a place where if you were bad, you didn't, you didn't step on the court until you were ready to play at that level. Mm. Uh, these kids were just like, yeah, we're, of course we're bad. Like we haven't practiced for 10 years. Like they have, we just, but we like to play. And so we come out and do it and that, and I know it sounds trivial, but the, the comfort with, with being where you're at when you're there um, in skill level in China really blew me away. And again, I was coming from sort of an overachievery school. So it was even that more, much more revolutionary. Mm. Um, the comfort with failure and, and being bad, but also the, the belief in the ability to incrementally get better, uh, I think is uniquely Chinese. So again, I'm going to go back to Jack Ma. Jack Ma, I think is the ultimate hero with Chinese characteristics at the young China. Group, yeah. So I think yeah. Consultancy. We're doing something called the, um, the Hero Project, which is more or less a literary analysis, as well as sort of a business analysis. The idea is that our concept of a hero in the West is radically different than the concept of a hero in China. Our concept of a hero in the West is someone either is born with supernatural talents, Superman, mm -hmm. or gets bit by a spider and develops them freakishly. Spider-Man, or is super rich and super smart, again, God-given talents, and just builds a great suit around them, mm. Iron Man. Um, you know, you get a theme, right? It has nothing to do with them, really. Mm. In China, the idea of a hero is someone who goes up on a mountain for about 20 to 40 years, practices one move really hard every day in poverty, typically, or in some version of poverty, comes down and saves the village. That's mm. a hero. So Jack Ma mm. got turned down by Harvard 10 out of 11, or 11 times, I believe. There is 24, and I might be botching the numbers, but 24 people applied to KFC. I think it was 25. 24 people got the job. Jack didn't. He failed. Everyone said he was too small, not smart enough, not attractive enough, not intelligent enough, could never scale, could never raise money, couldn't understand the internet. He was just an English teaching guide at the mm. beginning. And in spite of the odds, Jack persevered through grit, through that eat bitter mentality that was defining of the older generation and succeeded. Are those stories really true or are they just made up to make it sound like a hero story? God, so, you know, <laughs> every story has, has parts of it that are a myth. Yeah. I, I really no, I'm just I, I'm just I'm just joking. No, no, it's, I actually think I think it's I know that, I guess, but... because we're really talking about cultural myths at this point. Yeah. By the way, I think Jack Ma's story is China's story. The country. Um that, that's what I would have um um thought is a Chinese hero story, you know, like it's the same about Xi Jinping, right? Like, well, he had to go into the countryside and he was like one of those suffering and now he's the yeah. President think about, think about what China's modern story is. The whole Fu Xing. So China, in 1990, uh, 1991, China redid its education system. So after Tiananmen Square, two years after Tiananmen Square, China created the, uh, a different education program that instead of focusing on Mao and how great he was, focusing on the entire history of China. Um, what they did was they established that China was, was, was once the strongest country in the world, wealthiest, mm. best by a lot of different metrics. Um, And then it became abruptly very weak for two reasons. Part of, part of that was uh, their own arrogance and their, not will, their, their insularity and not willing to open up to the world and miss the Industrial Revolution. And part of that was outside aggression. 100 years of the century of humiliation, which is something that we quote often, so 100 years of being belittled by the international community, being too weak, being a half colony in their own country, too weak, too poor, too uneducated. Mm -hmm. um, But through persistence and hard work over the next century, through the grit 
of the generation, the baby boomer generation coming out of reform and opening who were willing to work harder or longer for less than anyone else in the world and build not just their country, we think about it as their country, but change the fate of their personal families. China, the modern manufacturing power, was built one family at a time trying to change their fate. And, that, and that's how modern China is a competitor. Through hard work, through relentless grit over a long period of time, against the odds. It's a Cinderella story, really. Mm. But it's China's. It's, it's the greatest Cinderella story of, of, of our time, <laughs> according to most people in China, really. And, yeah. and there's a lot of really good evidence that that's kind of true. Um, and I don't want to sound like, you know, waving the, the Chinese flag too hard here, but in my lifetime, I'm born in 1990. I think you're a couple of years, so like same range we're talking yeah. about. Um, I'm born in 1990. In my lifetime in the United States, I've watched our per capita GDP. So like the average wealth of a family, it's not a perfect metric, but it's an okay one when you're comparing international countries um, and, li- and lifestyles. Our per capita GDP has increased two and a half times in my lifetime. So maybe the quality of tutoring my parents were able to afford for me, two and a half times better. Mm. The type of car, two and a half times better. The trips that we were able to take, two and a half times nicer. You, know, you get the idea. Mm. My friends born in 1990 in China, the exact same year, they've seen their per capita GDP, the wealth of their family, the wealth of their town, increase 27 times in their lifetime. Mm, yeah, yeah. It's, maybe it's just a developing country. Conversation. I mean, maybe it's, maybe it's just, all right, what about India, right? Yeah. Developing, developing country. Yeah, but it's still like the, the change that they're going through, it's amazing. Yeah, it's something you really like. If you haven't been there or talked to the people, you can't really grasp it. It's, uh, and yeah, it's, you have to imagine it as something you're witnessing every day. Yeah, yeah. So if you go to the United States, I mean, honestly, this young generation has had more interaction with the outside world, not just the United States, Germany massively. Germany is one of the most respected countries from within China and a huge number mm. of study abroad students go there. They go there for work. They try to work at international German companies. Um, there's an enormous amount of respect for Germany. And yet they look at Germany, they look at the United States. Germany, by the way, in that same period of time, I believe is 1.9. So the per capita GDP has increased 1.9 times, which by the way, is extremely good for, 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 a, for a country of that existing wealth. Um, again, so India was only five. Uh, and Brazil around 3.2. What, what China has achieved in that period of time is internationally unique. There's no other country besides Vietnam of that scale who's even in the double digits. Mm. And so we, they go to these other places and it kind of looks like we're standing still. Actually, the comparison, the increased exposure to the outside world leaves a lot of young Chinese folks thinking like, look, our government is flawed. Absolutely. Are our city super clean? Not really. Um, but you know, their governments are flawed too. And at least ours gets stuff done. Hmm. Yeah, it's a different perspective. Yeah. And they've witnessed it. There, there's, their whole life is evidence to that being at least partially true. Yeah. Um, so as much as I enjoy talking to you, I actually have no idea when we started uh, this podcast. <laughs> Great. That, that's how <laughs> you know. Let's go to one of the last questions because I really still want to talk to you about you as well. Um, you're Thanks. also working as a keynote speaker and you have, uh, yeah, you speak at Google, for instance, and I read that you're also going to Egypt very soon. So mm. what kind of reaction do you get to your keynotes and uh, what are the people asking? Like, um, yeah. Um, so I don't like, like where, where I want to get with this question question is I guess that the reaction in the U S is pretty different from that. What we, what do you get in China? Right. Yeah. Okay. So I think that actually is the best comparison. So, so everywhere else in the world and then China. So one of the, my proof of concept is if I can give a speech in China and people think it's interesting. Um, cause I can, you know, no, I, I really don't feel like the conversation in the United States is at a, in the United States, and I've actually given speeches on four continents in this last year, which is pretty darn cool. And I don't expect that to be the pace for my for the next ever so <laughs> as it comes along. Um, and and usually the reaction kind of everywhere else is similar. I would say there are some nuances that are really interesting. Mm. But if, if I was saying something in China, there, there's a saying in China, "Pangguan jiqing," it means the observer or the outsider sees clearly. 
And, it, and if my outsider's perspective was perceived to have enough legitimacy, if there was enough sort of common ground, but also brought some new something, and I, I often give these speeches in both Chinese and English, so I, I think that definitely helps. Um, then, then I'd really be on to something. I, I gave a speech at the um, Columbia Global Center in Beijing. I had 106,000 people watching the live stream. So not even the, not even the, you know, after the fact video, just the live stream, which is, I didn't know that until afterwards. I thought there was 100 people in the room. And thank goodness, because I would have been... <laughs> Uh, that's a challenge you know, uh, <laughs> using the bathroom in an inappropriate place I don't know how else to say that in an inappropriate way. Um, so the reaction is usually everyone wants to talk about what they know which is the government everyone wants to talk about isn't the government terrible not in China this is outside of China everyone wants to say doesn't don't these young people hate their government really that I mean every, everyone says a million different things but usually the question is angled at that isn't it bad and aren't these young people wanting freedom and the word that people use is freedom mm -hmm. not westernization but freedom um and and i think it's a great question uh because it's informed by what people engage with in china this is one of my biggest issues with the way that china is being covered is that we we only focus on what's newsworthy which is their job but, and what's newsworthy is always sort of big, bad government, you know, communist government that's, that's adversarial and, um, and human rights infractions, which are absolutely existing and terrible within China. Mm. No doubt. Um, not, are, are they the worst in the world? No. It's what's happening in Xinjiang, for instance, right now. Um, really terrible. There's, there's no doubt about it. And, and we all need to be talking about it. Mm. Is it the only thing that's happening in China? Absolutely not. And I think as an American, I can really speak to this. If the only thing that people knew about America was my government, was President Donald Trump, I would be really upset. Because I would hope that people would know about me, would know about my friends, would know about my family, would know mm. about the things that we're thinking, feeling, interested in. Um, and so usually what I try to show people is not what the government and not what the macroeconomics look like, although I do think that that people do impact that what mm -hmm. i try to focus people in on is our macro themes around identity formation within the country and 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 showing people what life could look like from a seat within china and then why people mm -hmm. could think and feel and, and look at things that way okay is that also what you're doing with your young china group i think yeah, it's called so young china group isn't young it china group you're exactly right so young okay. china group so the book is called young china group is called young china group i'm not you know it's very creative <laughs> to, 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 if it ain't broke, don't fix it um what we do is we explain how cultural identity how these identity questions who we are what do we want to be what do i want for myself my family my country what do i like what am i afraid of what what what's my dream trip what's my dream um purchase what do i want what does safety mean to me what does financial security mean to me mm. um, i try to explain how identity considerations drive economic and political impact so that's mainly about research or research like... and then research interpretation look there's okay. a, there's some great firms putting out impressive numbers that we can't compete with. We don't have the scale. We don't have the investment at this particular point. Um, what we do have is a, is a different perspective uh, on what that research indicates. You know, a lot of folks, what their research tells you is why something happened three years ago or that it did happen three years ago or that it's happening right now and might happen again in the next month or two. What we try to chart are the larger cultural trends that have lasting economic and, 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 and political impact particularly economic because we try to avoid politics to a certain extent because there's enough people doing a lot mm. of great work in that, in that realm. Yeah, okay. so, um, it's research driven, but then a lot of our analysis on top of the research, I think is, is, is probably the major thing that makes us different than other folks. Cause a lot of it is not just knowing the thing. In fact, I would say writing the book, I don't like to write that much, honestly. I'm not, I, I love to read. I'm a, I was a literature student. I love to read. I um, studied psychology. I studied business. But reading is what really made me happy. And, um, but 
you know, it's sort of like if you, if you, someone really liked the, um, if someone really liked to listen to orchestra music and you handed them a Yeah, they wouldn't be violin, able to play. Like, yeah. those, are different, those are different skills, right? <laughs> yeah, so, sure. So what I explained is that about half of what I do is know, is, is do the research to know the thing, half. Mm. The other half though is figuring out a way to describe it in, in a way that Westerners in particular, also, China, uh, also folks in China, and this is a different practice, but so that Westerners can digest, so that they can understand. Mm. It's so linguistically and culturally distant that even if you directly translate things, it doesn't make sense. Mm. If it did, I wouldn't have a job. Google Translate would come in and you know, there would be no need for me and we'd just, you know, I'd, I'd start trying to study something else or I'd just, you know. Yeah, that's true. Try to, it's true. So yeah. China does not translate well. What I, what I do is try to show people the big picture and then where all these different puzzle pieces fit in a way that's digestible, approachable, and then ultimately actionable. Because without seeing, you know, all these companies are typically run by macro strategists or people who like to see the big picture. And with China, you can't. Because what you're shown is the extraordinary news stories. You know, human rights, okay, what do you do with the story about human rights infractions, um, currency manipulation, trade war, and IP theft? Like you put those, if those are the only puzzle pieces you're working with, and then like super rich kids buying product. Okay, those are my six, those are my six puzzle pieces. What does that mean to me? I have no idea. And I won't touch it with a hundred foot pole. But China is also the most attractive consumer market in the world because of its size and its potential for growth. The consumer trend, consumer boom in China has not even really started yet. And so figuring out how to, it's, it started a little bit and we're seeing yeah. a little bit, but there's huge parts of the population who haven't been able to touch it because China is not rich yet, despite what it looks like in Shanghai and then those great hotels that people are staying at when they go. That's not China yet. Yeah. And it may not be China entirely. Yeah, there's definitely a huge market potential. I think that's uh, what people should definitely be aware of. But like another question, or like to turn this around, um, your book is about the restless generation and how it will impact its country and the world. So if you would, Like, just as a last question, like, if you could pick one thing that will really have an impact on the United States and on Europe, yeah, deriving from this generation, what would it be? I sort of hinted at it before, but I think it's the issue of pride. I think this young generation who's been exposed to the outside world, who's traveled, you know, two-thirds of all passport holders in China are, are post-80s and post-90s, two-thirds. So they're young. They've, they've grown up studying English. They've grown up watching our TV. They've grown up, you know, there, there's a fluency in the outside world that the outside world does not have in China. They've grown up exposed. They've also grown up watching their country, watching their families build something entirely different. And they've got a strong sense of self. I think, we, I think where we most underestimate China is in the integrity of their pride and the validity of their pride, um, that they don't want to turn into something else. So the biggest impact I see for Europe and for the United States, but really for the outside world. I, 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 I'm going to speak in Egypt, you're, you're right. I, get, I did mm -hmm. a, a keynote speech in Abu Dhabi recently as well. I was in Australia and you get off the plane and all of the real estate advertisements right off the plane are all in Chinese. And, and there's this idea of Easternization. There's this idea that for the last, you could say 500 years, but certainly post-World War II, the world order, the, our world of commerce, trade, our international legal system, mm -hmm. um, international political system. You know, we call it the United Nations. Uh, in the United States, we call it the World Series. There's only one Canadian team. Other than that, it's just us. Um, and obviously, I don't want to undermine the United Nations that way. It's, but, but there's the perception in China that there's this world system that was created in the Western image. There was, it was created to benefit the people who created it. Mm -hmm. uh, And China is so large. There's 400 million millennials in China. So post 80s plus post 90s. And their capacity for political and economic consequence on the global scale, that's never been accomplished by an Eastern country. Singapore, Japan, South Korea, Thailand, when those countries and those economies that sort of uh, Asian tiger economies, the miracle economies as they're sometimes called, mm. they did not have enough Oomph. They did not have enough political or economic impact 
to change the way that our world spins. China has that. And so if you were to write yeah. westernization into your Microsoft Word, uh, you'd get like the red squiggly lines underneath. It would come, no, excuse me, westernization, it would capitalize the W. It's a proper idea in our heads. We all know what westernization means. If you were to write easternization, they would say it's a spelling error. It's not an idea we have in our heads yet. And I think it's one that we have to really consider. Ultimately, what parts of our Western culture are going to be impact, impacted by China? And, and then where are we going to meet in the middle? You know, there's this new culture as it gets impacted by China. Okay, it's not Westernized. It's not totally Easternized. But there's something kind of new forming. And, and what is that in the middle? And, and how do we align ourselves with that? How yeah. do we get into that? How do we prepare for that? How do we create our brand image around that? And, and how do we be respectful of a, of a China who doesn't want to just westernize as they modernize? Yeah, that's uh, a great thought. It's also part of my daily work, actually, because, um, yeah, I trying or what I'm doing is basically try to make people accept that easternization is already happening. You know, you can't stop it anymore. So accept it. So it's a process of change and it kind of will rearrange everything. But yeah, yeah it's, it's really you great could song. fight against it or you could align with it. And, and suddenly the biggest opportunity in, 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 in modern economics is at, is at your fingertips. So yeah. do you want to just deny that because it makes you uncomfortable? Or do you want to equip yourself with knowledge, with understanding? With, with, you're talking about cross-cultural empathy. This isn't like a PhD. Yeah. You're talking yeah. about the ability to maybe see the world from a different point of view. Yeah, but this process always means to work on it, right? As you said, like uh, being open-minded and uh, inform yourself and so on. It's always a process of work. So yeah. it's like our job to split up this and make it less look like work, but actually fun. Exactly. Right? Again, I, I think of what the work that we do is trying to make China approach. This isn't this massive discovery necessarily. It's just trying to, you know, we're like friendship counselors on a global scale. It's, uh, <laughs> It's true. It's like, Maybe, you know, sometimes yeah. it's really academic. Other times it's just being like, look, man, you got to put that feeling of, of pride and superiority. You got to put that aside because they, and, and by the way, both sides have it. This isn't yeah. just, yeah. For, just yeah. the United States. China does as well. And, and the idea yeah. of both of us putting that to the side so that we could work together. Yeah, absolutely. That's, a, that's the future to me. So I think we have to come to an end. <laughs> Thank you so much for participating in a podcast. It was really great talking to you. And yeah, I hope you keep us updated on your further re uh, research. And uh, maybe we'll do another podcast in a few months or years. I, or whatever. I would love that. Thank you so much for having me. I can and, run and we can get a still of the book if you want, or I can just send it to you and we can splice that in. What would you, I realized I should have. You I'm run and I keep talking and then you get back and then you should have book. Okay, <laughs> cool. Yeah, so for everyone looking at a blank wall for a little bit leave <laughs> okay so for everyone who's still watching uh, or listening um of course we will put a uh, book and the link to the book in the show notes um or like wherever you watch it you will probably find it somehow in the subtitle uh, so you can easily uh, get the book and i can really recommend it it's really worth reading it i totally enjoyed it and yeah i think we'll also put a link into the show notes of sex work so you probably have a young generation dot arc something yeah that's the book exactly perfect i have young china group .com, um and I also we can we can link to a recent speech honestly i gave a speech recently at the hong kong foreign correspondence club that was 15 minutes um short sweet and the q a as you'd expect at the hong kong foreign correspondence club was excellent and feisty and provocative and um and you know just what you hope for with 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 tough hong kong foreign correspondence so okay, i think great, yeah. your audience will really enjoy it yeah perfect that will also be in the show notes or anywhere in the subtitles perfect thank you so much thank you so much for having me it Bye. was an absolute pleasure <laughs>